welcome to this week's Conovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. Welcome back. We are here in the studio. Uh, been providing you a few updates on what's been going on here at the show most recently. Uh, we've got uh, some interesting guests all lined up in the queue, so you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, we also are uh, recently announced the launch of the Innovators Community. So go check that out over at the innovators.community. You can find out more about it, get you an opportunity to kind of plug in with all the innovators that are listeners and followers of the show and of the podcast. As you know, we're in season 13 now and around doing this for, uh, for a little bit of time. So uh, hop on over there, get a chance to uh, be part of the community and uh, share your own expertise, but also find people that you can, uh, you can plug into. So with today's guest, so this is kind of going back to my hometown. I grew up in Chicago, as many of you know. My original major uh, was architecture. Got smart, switched to engineering, computer science. Uh, but uh, grew up in Chicago and uh, have uh, always uh, you know, been a hometown boy. Yes, I am a White Sox fan. Some of you have met me out in public know that I always have my White Sox uh, hat on. Don't have it on here in the studio today. But today, we have a special guest from Chicago. Uh, from an organization that I hope many of you have heard, at, heard about. If not, you're going to hear about it today. And this is an organization and what they do to not only entertain, but also help unlock that personal creativity that we all have. So let me bring in Kelly Leonard. Kelly is the executive director of uh, at Second City. Now, for those of you who don't know what Second City is, um, I think of Second City, and, and Kelly's going to correct me with everything that's been going on with Second City here most recently, is really the improv group that we have seen many of the most famous entertainers out there come through, um, including, you know, John Belushi and others. Um, and it really is an amazing experience to go to a Second City event and a live performance and watch what's going on. So, Kelly... Thanks for taking the time out of your calendar to join us here on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So let's give a little bit of context. I'm not sure all the listeners, particularly given that we have a, a fairly large international audience, about what is Second City? So the Second City opened, opened its doors in 1959. And we were not only the first, what, like, off-loop theater, so we're like what off-Broadway is in New York, but we created this new art form which used improvisation, uh, to create sketch comedy. Uh, and we were immediately successful. So some of those early casts include people like Mike Nichols, Elaine May, Alan Arkin, Joan Rivers, Robert Klein, Fred Willard. So it really started like huge. And then <laughs> that kept going. So other alums like Bill Murray, and you mentioned John Belushi, and Gilda Radner, and John Candy. And then most recently, people like Tina Fey, Stephen Colbert, uh, Steve Carell, Keegan Michael Key. So we're most known for being a home for improv-based sketch comedy and producing huge stars for decade after decade. But two other things have been going on that whole time. One, we've had a school. We, we teach people uh, improvisation and not just to get them on Saturday Night Live. A lot of people use these skills at home and in their jobs. Uh, and then we also have a corporate division called Second City Works. And this is probably our biggest division. And we get brought into we do about 400 engagements a year. Um, this year we're trending more like 450 engagements uh, with Fortune 1000 companies uh, to unlock creativity and innovation inside teams, to use comedy as a communication skill. There's a whole suite of skills that improvisation teaches someone that is becoming increasingly relevant, uh, which is surprising given the fact we're an almost 60 year old institution. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, in fact, in fact I went back, there was a, a blog post that I wrote, oh, it's got to be five years old, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. talking about the role of improv in unlocking your own personal creativity. So is that what Second City Works does, is trying to help people kind of find that, that uh, I don't know what you want to call it, that internal spark, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we, we work with individuals and teams, you know, across a variety of platforms. But, you know, the, the thing is, this is all just human being stuff. Uh, it is, I, we put up these, you know, sort of uh, constructs like, like business and uh, wellness and personal life. And all of it is just human beings working with other human beings. And what the founders of Second City uh, discovered quite keenly uh, is that 
human beings are not naturally good at working with other human beings. So well before, you know, behavioral economics showed us that people behave irrationally, these guys kind of knew it. Um, and so improv skills are all about getting people to focus and listen, uh, giving people kind of like uh, human being nudges uh, that allow them to be more collaborative, more creative, more aware of what's going on in a room. And this is stuff that we've honed not just on stage or in the classroom, but because we've been working with corporate audiences for decades now, we've really fine-tuned the application uh, as it can be used in business. <laughs> and so in this case, one of the skills I see in improv that is very much lacking in the business world is what some refer to as active listening yeah. versus the passive listening. You're thinking about your answer with, without really thinking about or listening to what the actual other person is actually saying. Does that play into it then? Oh, completely. So we wildly overestimate our ability to perceive what's going on in a room. We think we're catching everything. Um, and what, what we know, and science shows us this over and over and over again, um, that people need practice in listening and in focus. And if they don't have that, they're missing a lot. Uh, so I'll give you an example. One, one of the exercises that we bring into a business is we'll get uh, two people paired up to have a conversation. And there's a rule. Uh, and the rule is uh, that each person needs to start their sentence as part of their conversation with the last word the other person said. And what this does is really force people to listen to the end of sentences. And you discover a couple things right away. You discover that it's hard. Uh, you discover that people uh, are not used to this and it's uncomfortable. Um, that they have to maybe take a moment to think before they respond. And then as we unpack the exercise when the first time they, we do it, we say, yeah, well, this is the problem is you're usually stopping to listen about halfway through in order to think of the thing that you want to say. And when we're improvising on a stage, making something of this, you can't afford to listen to the end of someone who might be crucial information coming at you. It is no different in life, and it is no different in business. And this exercise really brings that to home for our participants. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it is one of those things, right? Because, you know, we all, we all think we're good listeners, right? But in yeah. reality when you all of a sudden are realizing that you've daydreamed off on something and really not have even caught what the person said, um, we kind of get reminded right. of it yeah. all the time. It's, it's really, it's, it's a lot harder than people think. It is, and it's even worse now because of our addiction to digital devices. I mean, you know, now that we've got these phones, that are like hip flasks in our pocket. Uh, I was talking to Adam Alter, who's a psych professor at NYU, he just wrote this great book called Irresistible. Uh, and his research shows that simply having a phone on a desk, even if it's upside down, not facing up, uh, limits our ability to communicate. Um, and he also, he, he, it's a great exercise. He goes, all right, uh, right now, if your feet are on the ground, can you reach your phone? So I ask everyone who's listening to this, do that. Are your feet on the ground? Can you reach your phone? I will bet you 95% of the people uh, listening to this right now can reach their phone. That's not healthy. <laughs> so, you know, part of the problem is I think is also a little bit of this digital addiction problem, right? Of, uh, you know, we, we, we get that in yeah. and hit every time we get a Facebook like or an inbound email or something. Yeah. And we get to this interrupt, interruption driven kind of society. But there's also yeah. this research and then, out there around this whole the of interruptions impacting that creativity side of it. Mm -hmm. So, hey, we're going to take... Absolutely. So, the neuroscience is very clear on this. Uh, instant messaging. Yep. And, yeah, well, instant messaging is a perfect example, right, of the, uh, uh, you know, that, that need to um, feel like you got to respond. If someone sends you a message, you feel like, well, they're, expect they're, st they're sitting there. It's like having a two-way conversation on the phone, right? Right. It, it's incredibly limiting uh, to actual productive communication. So, you know, one of the things about improvisation is it forces you to get away from your phone and forces you to interact with other human beings. And one of the reasons that people come out, you know, so uh, positive after an improvised experience is because actually that, that point of actual communication, having someone actually listen to you, releases a really great uh, uh, feeling in the brain uh, and allows you to collaborate more successfully down the line. 
So we're going we're gonna to continue this conversation with, with Kelly Leonard. We're going to take this quick, short commercial break. When we come back, we're going to pick up our conversation around Kelly, his work at Second City, improvisation, and the role and impact that it can have on your creativity and innovation. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back after this quick commercial break. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk radio network, and you can get all the show notes over at Killer Innovations. Dot com. Welcome back to Kill Innovations. Before we get started, we need to jump in and give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors. In this case, today, Zoom is sponsoring this segment of the show. Zoom has been a longtime sponsor here of Kill Innovations. They provide the video collaboration technologies that we use uh, with our guests, but it's also something we use with our own teams. And in my day job as a CEO, and I have teams scattered out all over the world, being able to keep that team together, working better together no matter where they're at. I've used Zoom for my work in Rwanda, Africa, when I was in Sydney recently, New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, my regular trips to uh, Beijing or Tokyo works everywhere in the world, works great. It's the best tool out there for staying connected. So check it out, killerinnovations.com slash Zoom. You can get a free account. And that account will allow you to collaborate with up to 50, that's right, five zero participants. So you can run a webinar, you can bring them all together, uh, you can bring your family together, maybe a better option than uh, family reunions, which I just experienced, which is a whole different story. So check it out, killerinnovations.com slash Zoom, and uh, get your free account. So, Kelly, let's pick up our conversation. We were talking about... Uh, Second City Works and what you do with the, the corporate world with regards to uh, that training, but uh, how does this play into your work that you're doing over at the University of Chicago uh, Booth School with regards to uh, the behavioral science around improv? Is that tied in? Is this kind of the insight that you're getting from the works kind of leading, oh, yeah. really kind of digging into why it works? Exactly. So this is a really cool story. Um, uh, you guys might have heard about two years ago, the Second City office complex caught on fire. Um, and it was a really bad fire. They saved the theaters, uh, but most of our offices were completely destroyed. Um, and at this point, this is when I was switching over from running all of Second City and all our theaters uh, to doing more of the work in the corporate sector and innovating new stuff. So I'm like stuck in this terrible temporary office uh, with like six other people. And we have this theory in our work that a lot of creativity comes out of discomfort. So a lot of improvisation is really making you comfortable uh, being uncomfortable. Um, and I was very uncomfortable at this point. Uh, <laughs> and looking for a project, and I have been reading books on negotiation skill. Uh, and a lot of them mention the importance of improvisation when you're negotiating, but none of them went deeper. Uh, so I did a Google search for academics uh, in Chicago teaching negotiation. I found a bunch, uh, took a bunch of meetings, one of which was at the University of Chicago with a fellow named Eugene Caruso. He invited his wife, Heather, uh, who runs the Center for Decision Research at Chicago Booth. She's a behavioral scientist. And as I'm giving my rap on improv, right, I'm talking about all the power of improv, they're smiling back at me. Uh, and Heather says to me, Kelly, we have decades and decades of research that show that people make bad choices for themselves just on everyday decisions. You have a practice and an art form that allows people to make different and better choices. Those two things have never been put together. So that's what we did. We went and ended up collaborating with the center at Chicago Booth, the most, one of the most prestigious business schools in the world, and we're studying behavioral science through the lens of improvisation. So we're basically now getting data um, and putting existing research uh, to the kinds of robust uh, executive workshops that we lead, but also we're doing this in the classroom. We, we are, you know, uh, doing research projects with like 200 students to test out things like, uh, does creativity come from discomfort? And so far, we're, that's proven true. <laughs> so what are some of the experiments? Are, are you doing experimental work in this area, collecting up other research studies and trying to find the correlation? Uh, what are, I guess, what are the insights that, that, that you've yeah from from some of the the engagements you've had there you see well sure so you know one of them was a classroom experiment where we took 200 students and we taught them all the same give and take focus exercise so it was really a silent exercise that was uh, uh, you were instructed to 
be able to silently take focus from someone and give it back. Uh, half the group was just given that instruction. The other half were told that if it feels uncomfortable, that means it's working. And when we got the results back from this experiment, we realized that the people who were told that if it's uncomfortable, it's working, held focus longer and were more successful at giving focus, uh, like dramatically better. Uh, and now we're gonna run another 200 people through that experiment. So that's an example of the kind of, you know, insights that we're getting inside the classroom. Now, on the other hand, what we're also doing is taking existing behavioral science. So we talked about earlier the idea of perceiving other people and what, what their thinking is going on in a room. Uh, there's a piece of science called self-verification theory, which was new to us. I didn't know about it. And really what this science says is that um, most people don't necessarily want to be seen as their best selves, their most attractive, their smartest, which is kind of what I thought. No, most people want to be seen as they see themselves. So, for an example, if I'm clumsy, it's important that you see me as clumsy, clumsy so you don't throw me a ball. But I'm not like saying this to you, right? It's, it's, a, it's a sort of an unconscious thing. So, what we've done is sort of reckon, oh, that's an interesting a twist on something that we kind of knew a little bit, but there's a nuance here. So then we take our improv exercises and tailor it to that understanding. So when we're teaching executives, you're not just getting taught improv stuff to make you more agile, you're also getting the science behind it and you're experiencing it. So that's creating this really, really robust learning that's, that's you know, got smart, smart knowledge and doing. Uh, and then you have to share it. And this is the way we learn best. When we, when we learn something, we do it and we share it. That's how we learn most deeply. It's interesting because in the case of you telling, you know, half the students that if they're uncomfortable that it's working, it's almost, yeah. it's almost like this permission thing, right? You have permission yes. to be uncomfortable versus if I'm uncomfortable, that means something's wrong. So therefore I need to do something to no longer be. Exactly. Yeah, you nailed it. And, and this, is, this is important because... Yeah, I was just saying to a colleague this morning that over, you know, I host a podcast myself and I interview all these people who write business books and all these academics. And the same thing comes up over and over and over again, which is we are our worst enemy. Uh, our being afraid of not looking good, ourselves not giving ourselves permission to take chances. All of that stuff is what gets in the way of innovation. So if you can break down the fear, you have done a lot of the work already, but then there's more. Um, and this idea of giving yourself permission to feel awkward and uncomfortable, to recognize that you're going to fail the bulk of the time, not just like some of the time. Most of us are failing all the time. I always use this analogy, right? If, if it's a baseball context, right? If, if you are a 300 hitter, you are doing great and you're failing 70% of the time. Exactly. And it's, <coughs> it's what we tell in the innovation game in Silicon Valley that, you know, you're, you are top of your class. If you get one out of 10, you're right. into the marketplace. You are, you, you, you're beating everybody else in the marketplace by, uh, by a significant percentage. So we're going to step away. We're going to take another quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to pick up our conversation here with Kelly Leonard from Second City, learn more about what that role of improv is. And I've asked Kelly to kind of prepare for that last segment where he's going to share a couple of things that you can actually apply today in your day-to-day -day work in improving your own ability to be more creative, more confident, and uh, more willing to take risks. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. You're listening to Killer Innovations. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. Before we jump back into the show, I need to do a quick shout out to one of our new sponsors, which is HP. Now, some of you may be thinking, hold on, Phil, you were the CTO at HP. Uh, isn't this uh, kind of uh, inside, uh, you know, baseball with, with uh, the old company? And I'm like, yes, I was the CTO at HP. I retired in 2011. But the partnership with HP is more than just about a normal sponsorship. It's about their support for uh, the role that we're doing with hacking autism. Now, I started hacking autism when I was actually at HP. It was a corporate program. And then they encouraged me actually to take it outside and take it with me. And Hacking Autism is a program whereby we work on technologies for those on the autism spectrum, but we also look at employment opportunities. Those that have an autism diagnosis have an 81, that's right, 81, 81% unemployment rate. And I'm a big believer that you actually, when you're hiring process, you should look for neurodiversity. People who look at opportunities and look at problems differently 
than you and the rest of your organization do. And so therefore, it actually it ha creates a, a real spark to your innovation and creativity opportunities within your organization. So HP is sponsoring and the money that they fund for that sponsorship actually frees up the dollars that we can apply to the nonprofit activities. So uh, that is the, the, the motivator. But at the same time, HP does do great products. We're using, for instance, the new Z2 workstations to uh, run the show. We have an, uh, a new HP Slice here that we're actually running all of the Zoom collaboration on. And I am the proud owner of a, an EliteBook 360 a laptop. I love it. So go check it out, killerinnovations.com slash HP. You can see all the technologies that we are using now here in the studio from HP. And you can also see about opportunities to get uh, some good deals. So again, killerinnovations.com slash HP. And with that, let's continue on in our conversation um, with Kelly Leonard, Executive Director over at Second City. Now, Kelly, as we were talking earlier, you've got Second City Works. You work with a lot of clients. I do work a lot of clients, do a lot of coaching and mentoring, and I run this thing called an Innovation Boot Camp course. Um, but I always, it's always fun when you engage with these clients because you always get little different insights, little different set of stories. So share some of the stories from Second City Works and, the, and some of the interesting clients that you guys have been able to take, which you do at Second City, and apply it to the business world. Sure. Well, we're both baseball fans. You know, you're a White Sox fan. I'm a Cubs fan. We're not going to get into that. Uh, but a couple of decades ago, we got a call from Major League Baseball, uh, and they have a program that they'd run for years with high potential rookies. And what was happening is they bring in psychologists uh, to kind of talk to the rookies and put them through some sessions. And at this point, the, the rookies were not responding. They were not relating. Um, there was a lot of, you know, multiculturalism uh, at, at work here. Um, and they just weren't responding to these sort of like 50-year-old white guys in suits. Um, and they said, you guys do some of this kind of work. And so we came in uh, to work with uh, all these high potential rookies on things like how do you have a conversation with the press? Uh, how do you deal with relatives who want money? Um, you know, what are ways you can use improvisation to kind of pivot and be a better teammate? Um, and we've done this now for decades. So, um, and it's great fun. You also get to work with these guys who then become superstars. So it's interesting because you, you don't think about it being applied. You know, you think about it from the standpoint of innovation and creativity and having it applied along those lines. You don't think about it being applied to like, you know, dealing with family members who are asking you for money. Oh, absolutely. Well, this is the problem, right? I mean, this is, you're, you, we talked earlier about discomfort, right? That's an uncomfortable conversation, which very you can immediately relate to. Yeah, very uncomfortable. So, you know, in you, what you want to do is give these individuals, and this is what we do in our work, a sense of agency, that they have some power in the situation, but that it's not, sometimes it's not just a no, sometimes it's a work around, um, and, and, you know, you've got to have, like, kind of the skill and ability to hear what's really being asked of you, because here's the other thing, that people don't always, like, come on straight away and say, hey, can you give me money? You know, they're going to find ways of, of, of talking around that. You need to have the skills to be able to deflect that. So it's not, you know, second seat, most of our work is very pro-social, very positive, but also some of it is about getting out of these really sort of uh, uh, corners that we get backed into. When you're in a bad improv scene, right, the thing you need to do is to find a way to get out of it. And believe me, we've been through a lot of bad improv scenes. <laughs> well, <laughs> It, that's a good point. It's a good way to, I guess, position it, right, is how do you, how do you, uh, how do you get out of it? So what are some other examples of uh, where improv work gets applied uh, sure. into, uh, you know, into the corporate world, business world? So here's a, here's a bad improv scene that we were a part of. Um, we got a call in the box office uh, from a concierge at the Four Seasons uh, saying that a celebrity guest who wanted to come to the show and the person who took the phone call didn't like follow protocol, put them in, you know, the sort of side theater. Um, and had we known that the opera diva Renee Fleming was coming to the show, we would not have put her in the production that was illegally sampling her voice. So <laughs> Renee sits through an entire show where we're illegally using her, her material. Uh, but who, who knew uh, this opera diva is a bit of an improviser herself. And uh, we met the next day and she said, this actually sparked an idea because Part of my job, and she was a consultant at Lyric Opera here in Chicago, 
part of her job was to find younger audiences and find new collaborations. And so we embarked on this like multi-year uh, relationship with Lyric Opera where yes, we created a theatrical production together, which was totally cool. But what we also did was we started working, training young opera performers. We created videos for Lyric Opera to then reach out to find new audiences. So we really became embedded with them culturally because we needed to create this show together, but also as a business sort of saying, look, I mean, you are an old, old business uh, that's, that's uh, very different from ours, but you need the same things that we bring in, which is ways to reach and communicate with new audiences, ways to co-create with those audiences. So this has been a fantastic relationship that's developed over years that all started with like a bad mistake. Well, that's the funny part, right? So here it was, someone in your box office mishandles the, the inbound from the, from the concierge and it turns into this unbelievable long-term collaboration. <laughs> quite funny, quite funny. Um, so in general, can you summarize just some of the, the findings, the, yep. the common couple that you see with, with corporations that you run into? It sounds like the comfort thing is, is, is a common theme for, uh, for what you come across, which, which holds people back. Yeah. So, you know, A, people aren't listening. So we, we find we find that out. Um, also, people are prone to say no all the time. So we have to kind of teach them to, to not do that. Uh, we find that people are risk adverse. Uh, and that becomes kind of a top down thing, right? Because that they a lot of people talk about wanting their employees to risk, but then if their bosses aren't supporting that, or giving them language uh, that encourages them to do that. So it works both ways. And that, this is the other thing about the communication we find, which is that people always think it's a one-way street and it's never a one-way street. Someone is not listening uh, and someone is not being clear in their communication. So it, I often say this, like if, if the only thing we did at, at Second City is teach you to communicate 2% better, we will have changed the world. It is so much the case, right? Yeah. <laughs> You get to take responsibility that the person understands what you say. You just can't put it all on their shoulder to say they didn't listen either, right? Yeah, and that's the thing about being others focused. If, if you come from a place where your job is not to think of yourself, but think of the other person, you're going to be way better off. And, and while we say that, everything in ourselves, and the science shows us this, is built around thinking of ourselves. Our, our brains are wired uh, uh, to be concerned with our own well-being. I, I just spoke to a neuroscientist who said, we've been running from lions and tigers a lot longer than we've been ru uh, running to get to the bus. <laughs> and so if you understand that the way you're wired is to normally sort of just think about yourself, but instead you fight that and you figure out a way, a technique, a practice, that's what we bring in, these practices, to get you to focus on the person in front of you and the other people in the room, your success ratio is going to go up, way up. Perfect. So we're going to take another uh, quick commercial break here. When we come back, I've asked Kelly to come back with a couple of uh, things that you, the listener, can apply from improv to improve uh, your success, your uh, willingness to take risk, your ability to use improv. So don't go anywhere. You're going to want to listen in as, Ke as we rejoin Kelly after this commercial break. And he gives us a few tips that we can apply right away to our day-to-day -day lives, listening being the one that I have to do uh, a better job at. So don't go anywhere. Check out the show notes over at KillInnovations.com. Get all your links. We'll have all the links to Kelly and his work. But you're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Welcome back to Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We're continuing our conversation here with Kelly Leonard from Second City. So, Kelly, before we went to the break, I challenge you to come back with a couple of uh, words of advice, sage yeah. perspective from what you've learned. So, have at it. What can we apply as listeners today from the work that you've been doing at Second City? So I got two for you. Uh, so the first is this idea of yes and. So in improvisation, what we've learned is the one way that you can absolutely not innovate is by saying no. Um, so uh, when you have a brainstorming meeting, your next meeting that you've got, the rule that you give everyone is that they can't, for the first, like, let's say 10 minutes, for the first 10 minutes, everyone has to say yes and to every idea in the room, which means they have to uh, acknowledge that they've heard the idea, here's the yes, and they need to build on that idea even if that idea seems crazy. 
Because I will tell you, in my nearly 30 years at Second City, and I've seen all the great comedy that's come on our stage, the absolute best material seemed insane when it first came up. Uh, and I will bet you that is true for most innovators uh, in business as well. Uh, so that's the first one. I'm going to give you a second one. Uh, we talked about the listening and collaboration and all that. Here's a thing that you can do both at work and at home. So this is a parenting tip and a work tip. Um, is if you're having trouble communicating, you should play a game around a table called one word story. And what you're doing is you're telling a story as a group one word at a time. And what's great about this is it forces people to not try to run the conversation themselves. If they can only contribute one word, they have to listen to the word before, listen to the word after, they have to be additive. This, this drove my daughter nuts because she wanted to say hippopotamus or she had some idea in her mind of a word she wanted to say and she had to say the or an. And sometimes <laughs> your job is just to say the or an. <laughs> oh. Oh, I can use this with my grandkids. This will be oh, yeah. this will be total torture for them. Indeed. That is, actually, that is that's that is. But I, I've already come up with five ways to apply that just in the work world, just to make sure you listen. Um, yep. Uh, and you share the conversation. Yeah, and you share the conversation, and you build the story. Whether you you could use it as you know, I get called in a lot of time to do mission statements. Right. You know, how do you, you know? So you know, you can almost do the the old ad libs. You know, we are the best right. at underline, put an adjective in, da, 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 yeah. ver, you know, versus doing, actually, this, this could be an interesting uh, use of an exercise here that I haven't tried before. I got my value out of this already. Yeah. I know how I'm going to do right, good. Uh, my next session on uh, helping someone create a mission statement using, mm -hmm. uh, using this approach. Hey, hey, Kelly, if people want to follow what you and Second City and Second City Works are up to, how, where, where can they find information on you? So there's a bunch of places. Obviously, our website, secondcity.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at KL Second City. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn. You know, we're on all the different social media. Definitely check it out because as these insights start to arise from our partnership with Chicago Booth, we have a lot of client cases, um, and there's so much interesting work we're doing, like in the healthcare space. We work with tech uh, that, you know, at, at worst, you're going to be entertained. Well, and also, I would encourage you that if you have a chance and you want to go see a Second City production, take the time, go see it. You will, yeah. uh, you will absolutely uh, have a blast. Hey, talk a little bit. We got a, we got another minute or two here. Talk yeah. real quick about your book. Uh, yeah. Yes, and lessons from the Second City. You came out in 2015, but boy, it's yeah. been a lot of press. Oh yeah, no, and it's still it's still going. They're keeping it in hardcover. This is a thing I learned. If a business book is successful, they don't put it in paper paperback right away. Uh, so no, it's 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 a great. It's our first time we've ever sort of put this stuff down on paper, and we tell a lot of the stories like I've told today. But also we have an appendix of a list of games that you can actually take into your business. Also, I just yesterday got a copy of our Chinese edition that just came out. Uh, so uh, that's it's very interesting. The first translation, uh, uh, which are not cultures you think of as uh, very uh, unhierarchical, right? Uh, not a lot of yes and going on over there, uh, but there appears to be an interest in the younger community in that. Uh, it's perfect. So, hey, uh, Kelly, appreciate the, uh, the time and uh, on your busy schedule and love your work and we'll, uh, we'll keep track and maybe come back in about when it's appropriate. Give us a quick update on what you're doing in Second City. Thanks for having me. Thanks. So let's wrap up this uh, show today. We are uh, getting ready to head out on the road. We're going to be traveling here for another uh, couple of weeks or so. As you know, uh, if you've been following to the uh, – go back and listen to the show on uh, Orphan Innovations with my uh, grandson who's been recently diagnosed with West Syndrome, uh, which is an orphan uh, diagnosis. Um, and I've had to learn about the orphan drug situation. So you, you can go back and listen to that show. Many of you have sent us – uh, emails on that. I greatly appreciate uh, the support and the encouragement and ideas and links to other articles. So we actually will be in Florida. I will be doing a show from Florida. So don't, uh, don't worry. All the shows will, uh, will be continuing from there. And uh, we also just recently announced the, the Innovators community. So you can go to theinnovators.community. It's a, a Slack community with online uh, video uh, uh, collaboration that allows you to connect with the community of innovators uh, that are part of uh, the network here. So uh, 
you can connect with, for instance, John Osborne, who most recently was the chief innovation officer at Kroger Foods, and uh, Seth Taylor at Stotion up in Salt Lake City, and Woody Woodruff, myself, uh, Mark Vericcioni, um, Kim McNicholas, who's been on the show many, many times. Uh, so you can connect not only with us, but everybody else that's part of the community. It's a way to bring innovators together. Because uh, look, we are a little bit of a, a weird community. We kind of get looked at maybe a little strangely within our organizations. So this is an opportunity for all of us to come together, support each other, share our advice and share our expertise, but also ask for advice and ask for expertise. So check it out, theinnovators.community. Um, you can get all the information over there and join in. I am engaged on that every day, if not every hour. So it's a great opportunity and it's the way for us to uh, connect. So with that, we're going to wrap up uh, today's show and uh, uh, check out all of the archive back to 2005. I'd also encourage you to go check out Kim McNicholas's show. It's now available uh, pretty broadly. We've been uh, ramping up its reach. Um, she broadcasts over her radio shows over on KDOW in Silicon Valley. You don't want to miss it. Some great content on Kim's show. So find it over uh, wherever you find your uh, favorite podcast. And with that, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I know it takes a few minutes to listen to this. Appreciate it. Give us your feedback. Phil at Kilinnovations.com. With that, we're going to talk to you next week. And uh, don't let the uh, innovation antibodies get you down.